Alrighty, so here we are at the end of week three for math history, and um, I actually have a separate video that will wrap up Egyptians and Babylonians and talk about the Plimpton 322 and all of that, but I'm going to save that one because I think there's going to be a day in the not too distant future where I have to move and I've already got a recording of it, so I'll load that up then and let you watch it then. So, um, other than that, I put into the D2L shell for you to finish up reading chapter two in your the book that I've uploaded there. And um, so now we're going to move on. So finish out that and then start on the Greeks. That's what we're after. The Greeks will be chapter three in the Anderson book. And so what we're going to talk about first off is, um, well, let me find a map real quickly. We're going to talk about the fact that for, um, for our purposes, the Greeks, the, the Egyptians and the Babylonians have been dealing with very concrete, real-world examples and um, how they would use math in, in actually doing things. So this is going to be a departure from the concrete. So we're not going to be so worried about, you know, how do I map out my plot of land so that whenever the Nile floods, I still know <laughs> where my land is. And I'm not going to be quite so worried with um, how do I count my sheep, that kind of mathematics. Now I'm, I'm going very abstract. And in fact, what we're going to see is this is where proofs begin. Proofs for everything. In fact, the um, Greeks say, if you can't prove it, then I just don't want to see it or hear it. You've got to be able to prove it. So it's a much more philosophical world in the Greeks. And in fact, we know a little bit about Greek philosophy. Um, you've probably heard of a couple of people, so inside of that, the, the famous ancient Greeks, ancient Greek philosophers will say, you've probably heard of Socrates, philosophers, sorry, you've probably heard of Socrates, um, there's something called the Socratic method that is often used in modern day education. This is where instead of if a student says, how do I do this problem? You don't say like, okay, two plus three is five. <laughs> you don't just answer their question. Instead you say, well, what do you have there? You have a group of two. How can I represent the group of two? Can you represent the group of three? How can I join that group together? So the Socratic method is asking a bunch of questions <laughs> to, to get get at um, what the students already know and to help them kind of construct their own knowledge. So that's, people, people know that um, philosophy. And then Socrates had a student named Plato, which we've probably heard him, heard of him. And Plato will actually be the person who puts together something that's called Plato's Academy which we'll talk about a little bit as we go along. And the Academy is, there's actually some very famous um, pictures. If I can find one, I'll bring one to class. There's some very famous pictures of Plato's Academy where there are philosophers and there's mathematicians and there's maybe some scientists or astronomers and people like that. And it's all about people who are trying to learn things. And you'll see that they develop what would modern day we would call it a uh, curriculum okay and in fact we would call it the liberal arts curriculum that we use at a university in a lot of ways so Plato's Academy is the forerunner for that and we'll start seeing that come out so Socrates his student was Plato and then his student was Aristotle okay and in Webster brain I like this a lot because Socrates, Plato, and Aristotle come together to form the word spa. So I can easily remember who was the teacher and who was the student. Um, but these are really famous philosophers from Greek time, and we've seen them, and you've probably heard of them, and different things that they've put together. So um, philosophy, 
there's actually a lot of, um, I'll say, economic and political unrest. So what we'll see um, in the ancient Greeks is for economic, um, we'll see we have emperors. Like whenever you think about ancient Greeks, maybe some people might think about Shakespeare and Caesar. And um, there's two. There's Augustus Caesar and then there's Julius Caesar, right? And those are ancient Greeks and they were emperors. And they would be considered kind of in the noble class or the higher class of people. Um, and whenever I think of that, I always think about, oh, this guy, this, this nobleman or however you want to think about him who's sitting around in a toga eating grapes and somebody's got a fan and a palm leaf and they're fanning them. Um, so what you actually have going on there, and we had it in the Egyptians too, but we'll see a lot of unrest with this is we have an, a, a more upper level class and then we have basically a slave class and people who are, are working on it for us and doing things for us. So there's a very big divide. And then the political unrest, that comes back to, you know, we've got these emperors who are telling people what to do and stuff like that. And so you'll end up with Shakespeare and, and, and stuff that's, oh my gosh, it's legends, right? Um, the other thing with ancient Greeks, which, by the way, let me throw some dates out here. I haven't done that yet. I'm sorry. About 1,000 to 200 B.C. is the dates that we're talking about here. So these are still pre-Christianity and um, still quite ancient. Okay, 1,000 to 200 B.C. Okay, so the other thing I think of is Greek mythology. So think to yourself, do you know any Greek mythology? Um, for instance, Zeus. Who's Zeus? He's the god of all gods, right, in the Greek mythology. And, and he, if he gets mad, he might throw a, a lightning bolt down at us and, and kill us all or something like that. And then, you know, there's uh, the Greek goddess Aphrodite, who's, you know, the goddess of love. And then there's, who is it, Zeus's wife. I can't remember her name off the top of my head. Hermie, 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 something like that. Anyway, she's like the goddess of, of the home, right? She makes things whatever. Um, you've got Atlas who's carrying the world on his shoulder. So you just have those things. And what we see from that is that these guys are trying to explain the world around them. That's what we see happening. Um, and by the way, because I mentioned Atlas with a... a the world on his shoulders. Um, we don't often give this ancient of a civilization a lot of credit. There's a lot of people who think, oh, they, they thought that the world was flat all the way through Christopher Columbus, right? And in fact, that is not necessarily true. There's actually some proof, and we'll see some of it as we go along. Um, there's proof that they were fairly convinced that the world is round and part of it is because when Atlas is carrying the world on his shoulder, it's not a cube, you know, it's not a square kind of thing. It's a spherical, it's a, uh, a circle, circular kind of thing. So they knew that the world was round. Um, so kind of interesting, but they're definitely trying to explain the world around them and that's going to be more abstract and more philosophical. That's what we're seeing going on. Um, some cool stuff that's going on. Let me give you this. Pericles is an ancient Greece, Greek guy who has a quote that is that you should, everyone should have a love of beauty. Okay. So philosophically speaking, we should just, you know, all sit around and appreciate the world around us and nature and, and that kind of thing. And we should spend our time this way, you know, having a love of beauty. So it's just one of those weird philosophical things. But what we'll see is a lot of the Greek mathematicians that we're going to work with also have their own quote. So it's kind of interesting. It's not necessarily love of beauty, but, but we'll see some quotes coming in and uh, some interesting things that happen. 
So, okay, so there's that. Um, I'm going to say that the Greeks had something that the Egyptians and the Babylonians probably didn't, and that's metals. Okay, so why do we care about metal? We care about metal because I can make stuff with it. And if you just think about today, your modern world, um, there's metal in this pen, there's metal in your phone, there's metal in your keys, there's metal around your neck or your fingers or your, you know, whatever. We've got metal everywhere. But if they are living in a civilization that hasn't worked with metal, that hasn't figured out, oh, we can melt down this gold and we can make coins, for instance. As soon as I can start making coins, now, dealing with this economic and political unrest, now I can start taxing people, okay? I can make these people have to pay me, or I can give alms to the poor if I want to charity um, people who need some help. So there's stuff I can do, and we go, oh, I can now melt this gold or silver or whatever, and if you have some ancient or older Greek um, coins, they're probably worth a ton of money now. I can make weapons, okay? Not just any old weapon, because if we were Egyptian, maybe we had stakes or spears or something like that made out of metal. Um, maybe I could have had some arrows with, with stone for the arrowheads or something like that, but now I can make a sword, okay? If I can use metal, and it can be a heavy-duty, strong steel sword, so I can make some more um, impressive things. I can make um, tools for navigating. Something called the sextant is, is developed. A really good compass starts getting developed, things like that. I can make boats that have metal in them. So actually what we see is that in Greece is Athens, which is a little bitty um, city-state basically, a little, a little island kind of thing. And um, they had like the world's best navy for a while, right? It's actually really well known for conquering and things like that. And it's because they had the ability to shape these metals and do things that they want to do. Okay, so what about the, the Greeks? Let's get our map out. I mentioned it earlier. So far, we've had the Babylonians. They're over here between Asia and the Arabian Peninsula. We've got the Egyptians. Here's the Nile, and they're taking up a chunk of Africa here. When we see up here, here's the Italian boot, um, if you've got your map out. And we know today that would be Italy. Today, Greece would be just a small country, country over here on the right-hand side of Italy. But in that day, Greece actually encompassed all of what would normally be Greece, plus more, plus Italy, plus these little islands down here, and, and so on. And if you really look at that, the islands here are really close to Africa, right? And so you can see how with a boat that can navigate a little bit, we can get back and forth pretty easily. This is the Mediterranean Sea. I know, we need a geography class in the middle of our math class. <laughs> so this is the Mediterranean Sea, and you can see, and we'll, we'll actually see evidence of um, things being shared amongst them. In fact, um, when we talked about the Rosetta Stone, the Rosetta Stone was in hieroglyphics, Demotic, those are both Egyptian languages, and Greek, right? And the stone, was a clay tablet, so that makes it Babylonian. So all three of these cultures are present on that Rosetta Stone whenever you see them. So, the, I mean, they're, they're spread out, but they clearly had things to do with each other. So as you're keeping track of things for an exam, you need civilizations. So now we have three. <laughs> um, we'll start getting mathematicians today by name, which is awesome. And sooner or later, we'll get some cities in here and then artifacts. So add the Greeks to your list. That's what I will say about that. Okay. All right. So I think that's kind of a background on the Greeks and what we're dealing with here as far as um, changing from concrete over to abstract and more philosophical stuff. But we don't care about them as much as we care about the mathematicians. Yay. So the next little bit, probably several lectures, will be about particular mathematicians, their lives, because I think their lives are important. It's important for us to see 
that they had a life, <laughs> that they did things other than math, and to see how they contributed in a lot of different areas, not just to mathematics. So we're going to see a lot of those things coming into play. Um, the first mathematician that we know by name is Thales. So somewhere in your writings, <laughs> You should name him, if you're using index cards or whatever it is, T-H-A-L-E-S, Thales. He is the man. He's the first one that we know by name. His dates are about 622 to 548 B.C. Okay, so he fits squarely in the middle of our Greek um, 1000 to 200 B.C., that time period. Um, he's just the first one we know by name, and it's believed that the main reason we know him by name is that he may have been the first one, let's say he's the first one to be known to have followers. Okay. So this guy, actually it's interesting because he was his upbringing was um, in the olive crops. Okay. So he, he was a, a farmer and a trader. So it's a pretty humble beginning, so to speak. But he went from that to becoming an academic and a scholar and being around Plato's Academy and that kind of thing. And uh, that kind of elevates him a bit in his social status, if you will. So he's pretty pretty good at math. He's pretty good at some philosophy stuff. And we're going to see some of his philosophy here in a second. And so because he's really good at that kind of stuff, um, it kind of elevates him a little bit. And so he actually kind of ends up in the upper crust. And the way you know that he ends up a little bit better, <laughs> higher up status-wise, is because of some of the stories about him. So I'm going to tell you some stories. Um <laughs> One, I'm just going to put the dinner party story. Mm. The dinner party story. So, well, maybe I'll give a little bit. Why no children? That'll help you. Which, by the way, I think is a rude question. Okay, why did you never have children? Well, you don't know why that person didn't have children. That's... Not nice to ask that question. Okay, but here we go. He was at a dinner party, okay, which automatically should tell us a little bit of something about him. He's at a dinner party as a guest. Um, he's not serving the dinner. He is, he is there doing, having fun. So he's at a dinner party, and the host of the dinner party asks him, why didn't you ever have children? Okay, and Thales kind of, the story goes that Thales kind of sidesteps that question. He doesn't want to answer him directly. And so he, he redirects the conversation or whatever. And about an hour later, <laughs> there's a messenger. You know, because this is pre-cell phone days. So a messenger comes running up with a message for the host and says, Sir, sir, I regret to inform you, but your son has died. And the host of the party is beside himself and he's crying and throwing a fit and rending his clothing and lying prostrate on the floor. And he's so upset about his son is dead. And um, this goes on for a little bit. And then all of a sudden, Thales looks at him and says, you know, please get up off the floor. Your son's not dead. I sent that messenger to show you why I never had children, which is really a cruel thing to do. <laughs> okay. But his philosophy, I know, is all oh, mean, mean, mean. So, um, your son was dead, but now he's not. It's like, psych, your son's not really dead. Okay, but the idea behind Thales' story or making, making the host think that his son was dead is, you know, the, the intense emotional pain that the host is going through whenever he thinks his son is dead I never wanted to deal with that. That's what Thales is saying. But rather than telling him, eh, I don't want to deal with that, you know, he actually puts him in a position where he feels it for himself and then goes, ah, that's why. That's why I never had children. Okay, so that's kind of a mean, mean story. But it's a pretty popular one for Thales. So 
Now you know. He had his own quote. It was, know thyself. And that probably goes along pretty well with the story that we just had. Because if you know that you're going to be deeply wounded if you have children, then perhaps you should spare yourself that that agony, and that's kind of the idea here, right? The philosophical side of him um, doesn't want to, to deal with that, okay? And it's interesting because there's something that's called the seven sages. And you can look that up, Google it. Um, these are like ancient Greek philosophers who are really meant, said to have molded and developed Greek civil, ancient Greek civilization. And it's interesting because Thales is one of them. Okay, so this guy who did mathematics, who studied, um, you know, some stuff, he is actually, as far as we know, the first one who um, started insisting that if you're going to do something mathematically, you have to prove it first. So he's this mathematics proovy kind of guy and they say that he's one of the seven sages who molded ancient Greek civilization. So it's kind of kind of a high honor for a mathematician. So that's interesting. Um, there's also a donkey story. I know all the stories. It's fun. Tells you a little bit about themselves, about their lives. So the donkey story, um, this one supposedly is a salt merchant. And the salt merchant is trying to get his salt to the market. And so he's using his donkey to uh, transfer the salt to the market. And the donkey's carrying it. And somehow, the story goes, somehow the donkey ends up in a pit that's full of water. Okay, And the merchant is just beside himself because not only is the donkey about to drown in the water and we're in trouble and somebody help my donkey. But he also has a lot of salt on his back and that's a lot of money, right? So that's a lot of my merchandise and so he's really upset about both of those things. And so um, the story goes that the donkey's down in the pit and he's struggling and um, the merchant is beside himself and Thales just kind of stumbles upon this scene. And as the donkey struggles, as the water level rises and starts to get the packages that the donkey is carrying wet, all of a sudden the donkey quits struggling as much as the salt dissolves, which is interesting. And the story is that Thales is watching this and he's really just enamored with the idea of why is the, why is the donkey suddenly seeming to not have such a big difficulty? Why is he um, suddenly floating, basically? <laughs> okay. And the idea that comes to him is this thought of buoyancy, which is that the salt in the water, salt plus water, <laughs> makes the donkey float more. So supposedly as the donkey's floating better, and probably, you know, think about it, as the salt starts to dissolve, probably the packages on his back are a lighter weight too, right? Because there's less salt. So probably he's even more, more buoyant. So the story is the donkey quits struggling, and they have plenty of time because the donkey can float now, and they manage to get the donkey out of the pit. Donkey lives, but probably a lot of the salt is, is done for. So, but the idea becomes, hey, salt water is better for floating in than, than regular water. And supposedly Thales is the first one who really put together kind of a theory about that and then started trying to prove it. So we end up with a theory. And he wants to do find proof of it. So this might even be the beginnings, beginnings of what would turn into kind of the scientific method for proving things. So he doesn't get credit for that, but we do know he gets credit for the idea of buoyancy. So yay. Okay. What is he known for mathematically? He's known for measuring distances. And in fact, 
He's the first one that we know of, and the reason we know of it, this about him is because he had followers, and the followers told other people, and they wrote things down, and so um, we end up with actually accounts that are in Greek that we can read, right? That's fairly modern language, and so we know that he was known for measuring distances, and in fact, he wanted to measure the height of the pyramids, That was his goal. Can I measure the height of the pyramids? Um, there's a problem with that. With thinking about him measuring the height of the pyramids. Where are the pyramids? Egypt. They're in Egypt, right? This guy's in Greece. So we know for a fact, again, this is one of those things that lets us know that the Greeks and the Egyptians were actually communicating. Um, he probably traveled to Egypt to see the pyramids. So his idea was this, and it's a brilliant one that we use today, even in modern mathematics. His idea was if I take a staff and I put it in the ground, here's the ground, that, um, and we'll assume that the staff is a straight staff and that we place it vertically in the ground and that the ground is flat, that will make me a right angle down there, okay, if it's perpendicular, which we always assume those things, right? So his idea is, okay, if I have a staff, I put it in the ground, and I can measure the shadow of the staff, and at the same time, I have the pyramid over here, and it has a shadow, Here's the pyramid. Okay, his idea is, okay, well, uh, presumably at some point inside of the pyramid, now we know the pyramid, where it's vertical <laughs> to the ground, is somewhere at the highest point in the pyramid, right? So we're gonna have to be able to measure across the base and figure out what's the halfway point or whatever. Um, to figure out where this vertical is going to be. But his idea is somewhere in the pyramid, there is a point that goes all the way to the top, the very high, highest point of the pyramid, and that will come down and it will be perpendicular with the ground. Okay. If I can get that distance, how far is it from the edge of the base of the pyramid? And if I can measure the shadow of the pyramid, shadow of the pyramid here, then I can create this lovely triangle, okay? And this is actually a concept we use a lot in modern day trig and different, different mathematics. Um, you'll see it coming in all the time. So the idea here is that if it's at the same time that I measure this shadow and I measure this shadow, that I'll have similar triangles, okay? So he's the first guy that we know of who came up with similar triangles. And in fact, he put together these lovely proportions and uh, it looks like the height of the staff versus the shadow of the staff. We all know this one, right? We use it. Is equal to the height of the pyramid. versus the shadow of the pyramid. And we know that we have to probably make a little bit of an adjustment to the shadow of the pyramid and add this little distance here. But still, we've got these two lovely similar triangles and we can set up this nice concept of a proportion that we haven't had in the past, okay? And nowadays we use this all the time. You know, I'll, I'll be talking to middle school kids and they'll, they'll be like, yeah, I can set up a similar triangle. So they know that. Um, and of course we use it as we're starting to develop concepts like law of sines, law of cosines, um, things like that in, in a pre-calculus class or something like that. So if you're going to be a teacher, this is actually really, really helpful information. And maybe you can bring dailies into your lecture sometime. That'd be great. Okay, he is the first one we know of. Okay, he's also known to have, um, in addition to looking at the heights of the pyramids, he's also known to have looked at the problem where you're standing on a cliff. <laughs> Here's my cliff. There's a person standing up here. I know, I'm a terrible artist, so 
we all have to deal with it. There's a boat down here that's on the ocean. Here's my lovely boat. Okay, and he wants to know, okay, how far is it between me and the boat? He can have a, like a, a rod or something like that where he's sighting in the boat. Um, we can talk about angles of elevation. I didn't mention that, but if both of these have the shadow on this direction, then the sun must have been up here, right? So shadows, sun's in the same place, same time of day, blah, blah, blah. So here we would have the situation where he, he actually said, Thaley said, look, I can't walk across the water, okay, and I can't fly, okay? So if I want to know how far out this boat is, <laughs> then I'm not going to be able to do that by modern means at that time. Nowadays, we might would be able to fly, but he couldn't do it. So he says, okay, I, look, this is a triangle. And we actually use this problem in our calculus classes today, right? So can I look at angles of declination, okay, from the horizontal? Here's my horizontal coming out from me. What's this angle of de decline going down? And we actually happen to know if these are parallel lines, then this angle of elevation is the same of that angle of de decline. So he starts putting that kind of stuff together and looking at it and seeing some similar triangles and stuff like that. So really the first person we know of who's doing that kind of stuff, which is pretty cool. So, and we have stuff from his followers that says, hey, he was looking at this problem. So we know it's out there, okay? So that's Bailey's. Put him in your notes, make sure you know him. I can almost guarantee you that on the first test, right before spring break, you will have a question where I mention something about, it's probably like a matching question or a multiple choice or something like that, where I say, hey, Thales, who's he? And on the other side, you might have to know that his quote was, know thyself, or you might have to know that he dealt with distances uh, or similar triangles or something like that. So some kind of probably matching would be my guess. But you'll have to know him, and there's a lot of mathematicians coming up that we're gonna talk about, so you might want to uh, make, make index cards or something. <laughs> Do something appropriately. All right, the second mathematician that comes up, and I actually don't have dates for him in my notes. I don't know why. I probably just got a little bit lazy about it and didn't write it down. But Eratosthenes, E-R-A-T-O-S-T-H-E-N-E-S. -E -E um, so Eratosthenes also dealt with distances. That's what he worked with. However, you know, he didn't deal with anything small like the pyramids. Oh, that's just really small. Um, he's a little bit after Thales' time. Instead, he wanted to measure the circumference of the Earth. That was his goal. Okay, and I'm just going to digress for a second. He wanted to measure the circumference of the Earth. Circumference in this aspect means for a circle, right? So how big or round is the Earth is what he was after. And we can tell by his computations that he believed the Earth was round, okay? Um, we'll see that one of the things that he did, and please forgive my drawings, I'm not an artist again, I will say. Um, he's the one who actually set up lines of latitude and longitude for us. So he knew that, hey, if there's this imaginary line here in the middle of the earth that's called the equator, and then there's a, an imaginary line that's a, an equal distance above as this imaginary line that's an equal distance below, those are called lines of latitude, right? Lat, flat, they're the ones that are flat for latitude. So he's got these lines of latitude that are imaginary, but he's setting them up in his head and he's going, how can this be? Um, if it were a flat world and the sun were looking at us, the sun was shining down, then it wouldn't matter if I have a point here at the equator or here 
above it or here below it, okay? They would all have the shine, sun shining at the same time, on the same day, at the same angle, um, would produce the same shadow, basically, if it's flat, right? But he knew that wasn't the case. He knew that the sun's angle here at the equator is gonna be slightly different than the angle that's coming at it if I'm up, the, up this higher latitude, right? Or that is even different than the angle that's hitting the Earth at this lower latitude, which means that the shadows have different lengths, okay? So he knew for sure, hey, the Earth's not flat, okay? He had, he had like mathematical proving for this, okay? Um, in fact, um, what we'll see is, let me, let me steal my, my map again. What we'll see is what he did, so let's look at our map and think about it like this. Um, Africa, so the equator, I don't know exactly where it runs, but it runs somewhere through here, right? Right around the middle of the world. So if it's running through kind of the middle of Africa, the nice thing about being close to Africa for him is that's a really long continent, okay? So if the equator is running somewhere through the middle-ish of it, if I can set up a point somewhere around the equator, and if I can set up a point somewhere up here near the top of Africa, like Egypt, and try to get them on top of each other, and then set up a point way down here toward the bottom of Africa, and then I can actually take staffs and measure, like pick a date, March 6th. One year I can be up here at the top of Africa, the next year I can be in the middle, the next year I can be down here. Whatever the date is, try to be as close to the same date as possible, and we can measure those shadows and we can see the angles that the sun's at, and we know, hey, it's not, it's not equally hitting the earth. Um, so we can see, and Africa is really nice that way. It's a long co continent, and he could take different measurements and see that. So that's kind of the idea behind what he did. He really wanted to measure the circumference of the earth, and he did. He got a number. He was wrong, <laughs> okay? It was not correct at all. In fact, I think he undershot. I'm not sure about that. You can look it up if you really want to know. I think he undershot, like say he thought that the earth was, I don't know, 20,000 miles around or something like that. It was way less than what it really was. I think he was under. But it doesn't matter that he was not correct and that now we can actually measure those things and we actually have numbers for those. That's not the point. The point was he's very early. He's still BC, okay? He's using really rudimentary tools and he's like, hey, I can see that this is, this is not a flat earth. I can see that we're round, the earth is round, and I'm going to take these measurements, and I'm going to set a goal, and it's going to be a really lofty goal to measure the entire circumference of the earth with nothing but a, a rudimentary you know, sundial and some sextants. But I'm going to do it, dang it. And uh, he was wrong, but he tried, and that's what's really important. Okay, so there were efforts being made to measure the circumference of the earth. Okay, so what we need to know about him for sure, oh, he did something else cool. He came up with a plan to dam off the Nile. The Nile River. That's something else cool about him. And why would you wanna do such a thing? Because if I can put up a dam and I can control the flow of the water a little bit more, maybe we just won't get flooded as much. It's kind of like something really cool that Thales did. He was actually able, Thales was actually able to predict, um, I think it was a solar eclipse. And that's one of the first events that we have a date for. But if I can, if I can do a little math and I can figure out some stuff, then maybe I can actually see something that's going to affect real life, even using some math. So he wanted to dam off the Nile River, and I think he actually managed to make it happen. So um, some really cool things. We need to know that he measured the Earth. We need to know that he had lines of latitude and longitude. But we also need to know something that has his name that's not necessarily something that we can bring back to him. So you might have heard of this before. 
There's something called the sieve of Eratosthenes. And I apologize, I don't think I brought my 100 grid with me. Dang it. I should have brought one. Um, the sieve of Eratosthenes, it's actually a really cool technique that you can use for finding prime numbers. Okay, and it would be a 10 by 10 grid. So it would go 1 through 10 across, and then 11, 12, up to 20. And I'm not going to do the whole stinking 10 by 10 grid, I'm sorry. What I will do is I'll try to upload one into D2L. Um, I have one that I can upload pretty easily. And um, if you want to play with it on your own, you can print that sieve of their, or the 10 by 10 grid off, and then you can do the, the sieve by yourself. Okay, it'll be awesome. Um, but I didn't bring it with me, sorry. Okay, so the idea of the sieve of Eratosthenes is, is sieve means, sieve is like, um, it's like a strainer or something. It's what you would use if you were going to go gold rush, you know, looking for gold nuggets. You would take this strainer and put it in the water and then you would shake it and whatever is dirt would fall out and whatever is left would be nuggets. So the idea here is we're going to strain out this, this 10 by 10 grid and whenever I'm done, whatever is left, the nuggets that are left over will be my prime numbers. So the idea is mark out anything that's not a prime Not a prime, including multiples of primes. That's how we're going to figure out what numbers aren't primes, right? Okay, so mark those things out. Whatever's left over is going to be a lovely prime number. So first, we have to take a step back. <laughs> and primes are actually really important for us. We'll talk about why in a second. We're going to take a step back and we're going to get a definition for a prime number. So I hear a lot of times, especially whenever I'm working with future teachers, um, people will say, well, a prime number is anything that's divisible by one in itself, which is not quite the exact definition for a prime number. It's pretty close. Um, that helps me for, say, two, because two is only divisible by one and two, and so that works there. But I need a little bit more in my definition, so I would encourage everybody who's listening to this video to be very precise whenever they make definitions like this. Um, the actual definition should be somewhere along the lines of a prime number is something that has only two distinct factors, one in itself, okay? Because we got to talk about the number one. One is divisible by one and one, right? <laughs> okay, one times one gives me one, and that's okay. Um, but the problem is that one is not distinct from one, okay? Those are actually the exact same number. So you need two distinct factors, one in itself. So one is not a prime. Dang it. That's the weirdo. But it actually pays off for us because if we were marking out all multiples and one was a prime, then everything above it would be gone, right? Because everything's a multiple of one. So it's going to work out for us that we can get rid of one. But two, two is special. It's the only even prime. And the reason why is because anything else that's even is divisible by two. We know that, for instance, one is... Um, its factors are 1, 4, and 2, and 6 is 1, 6, 2, and 3. So clearly, anything that's an even number has got to go. So the way that our lovely um, 10 by 10 grid falls out, all of these vertical columns, every other one is going to be gone now. So all of those even guys, you're gone. You're not, you're not a prime, which makes the very next number is a prime. So anything that's left over is gonna be a prime. Three is a prime, that's awesome, okay. And I cannot worry about say six and 12 and 18 because those are already gone, but I do need to worry about nine and 15 and 21 and 27, right? Those guys, need to be marked out also. And if you're looking at the 10 by 10 grid, what you should see whenever you mark out these multiples of three 
is this nice cool diagonal pattern that comes in on the grid. So those guys are gone. Okay, and you'll get a lot, like we'll pick up 99 down here because that's a multiple of three. Okay, so he gets knocked out. Okay, five's a prime. Okay, um, all of the multiples of five either end in a five, which means I need to get rid of this column. The 15's gone, but not the 25. Or they end in a zero, right? So the zero's already gone because they were divisible by two. So I just need to mark out this center column. That's the one that I need to, I need to get rid of 25 and 35 and so on. Okay. So then people start saying, okay, well, seven's prime. We like that. 11's prime, 13's prime, 17's prime, 19's prime. It looks like everything left over is prime. So we're a little bit worried. Did I, could I just stop at five and not worry about any of the multiples beyond that? Or do I still need to check? Because seven's kind of ugly and I don't like seven. So if I have to find all the multiples of seven, I'm kind of in trouble. Seven and 14 and 21 and 28, I'm good so far. But next I'm gonna have, what, 35? Well, he's already marked out. Do I have to check all the multiples of seven? And the answer is actually yes, because there's a couple in there that we're gonna worry about. Down here somewhere is gonna be 49, right? So I wanna think about 49, because 49 is divisible by one and 49 and seven and seven, right? So it's actually exactly the square of seven, so he's got to go, okay? If I didn't check all of the multiples of seven, I'd be in trouble, because I wouldn't have gotten 49. And then somewhere down here, let me find it, is also 77. And 77, we know, is seven times 11, right? And again, if I catch it on the seven side of things, I don't need to worry about the 11 side of things. He'll be gone, right? But if I didn't check all the multiples of seven, I'd be in trouble. And there might be others, but those two for sure I know we need to catch them, okay? So then, oh my gosh, do I need to check all the 11s? Well, let's see, 11, okay, he's a prime. But then think about it, 22, 33, 44, 55, all of those are gonna be already marked out, right? So I think we're probably okay as long as we catch this 77 guy. So 13, oh my goodness, I don't wanna check all these. I certainly don't wanna to have to think about multiples of 17 if I don't have to. So the question comes in, when do I know if I need to still, still keep checking or if I've got them all, especially if I'm doing a 10 by 10 grid. So there's a really modern math way of checking. And that's why we're pretty sure um, Eratosthenes didn't have this, <laughs> okay, because it's pretty modern math. Um, the idea is if you want to know if a number is a number prime, that's our question. If you want to know if a number is prime, maybe some of you know it, I don't know. How far do I have to go checking, okay? For instance, let me check 100. It would be way down here somewhere, right? Well, we know 100 is not prime, but I just want to check. Okay, square root of 100. That's what I need to do. I need to take square root of 100 and I would get 10. Okay. Well, we know because it comes out nice and pretty and evenly, okay, um, it's not prime because it 10 times 10, right? But what about 99, for instance? That's not a nice, pretty even number. In fact, I don't know what it is. I just know that it's nine point something, right? Because it's not quite 10. Okay, so the question becomes, do I need to check 11 and 13 and 17 and 19 and 23 and 29? Do I need to, on my calculator, do 20, 99 divided by 29? 99 divided by 23? 99 divided by 19? And the answer is no. I only need to check the primes up to and including the square root of that number. That's the rule, okay? So for instance, for 99, I would check two. Well, it's not divisible by two, so I'm not worried about that. But then I'd see three, check three. Yes, 99 is divisible by three. So I'd stop because I know it, it's okay, I'm done. Let's check 101 though. 
Well, 101 is gonna be slightly bigger than 10, right? I don't know what that decimal is, I don't care. I just know I need to check all the primes up to and including whatever comes up to 10, right? So I need to check two. Is 101 divisible by two? Nope, because it's not even. Check three. Is 101 divisible by three? No, because the rule for a divisibility by three is add up all the digits. If the sum of the digits is divisible by three, then the number is divisible by three, and that's just a two. So nope, not divisible by three. Is it divisible by five? Well, no, because it doesn't end in a zero or a five. So I need to check, the only other one that's less than 10 is I need to check seven. So if nothing else, I can do 101 divided by seven and I know it goes in not quite evenly, right? So it's 14, oops, eh. Did I do that right? I should have subtracted a 70, I'm sorry. So four times seven would give me the 28 here, I'd have a leftover and it's not going to go in nice and pretty, right? Okay, so all I care about is that seven doesn't divide it evenly. So if two doesn't divide it evenly and three doesn't divide it evenly and five and seven, that's all of the prime numbers up to 10, that's only checking four numbers. That's not bad to figure out if 101 is prime or not. So I check those four, none of them divide evenly into 101. So therefore 101 is prime. That's pretty cool. It's a modern math way of checking it. Okay, the reason I don't have to check 11 is because 11 is bigger than this. And I know the worst case scenario here would be 10 times 10.1 or whatever it is times 10.1, right? So I'm not gonna have an 11 in there if it wasn't divisible by one of these times 11, right? So 101 is prime, but I know that 100 is not prime and 99 is not prime. So it's a pretty fast check. I don't have to check a ton and ton of primes. So it's kind of something cool. All right, one more thing about primes. There's a movie, there's a lot of movies actually. You should go watch a bunch of math movies. I think there's a math movie called Prime. But um, the one I wanna call, talk about is A Beautiful Mind. Have you seen it? Nope. I've heard of it. You've heard of it, but you haven't seen it. Okay, A Beautiful Mind, it's the story of John Nash, and he was a mathematician. He's a modern mathematician, probably in the uh, 70s or 80s, um, 1970s or 1980s. So very modern compared to who we're talking about BC here. Okay, A Beautiful Mind, and in The Beautiful Mind, John Nash talks to, he's, he's wooing his girlfriend. Apparently, you know, geeky stuff works sometimes. So he's wooing his girlfriend and they're out by a fountain and he's pointing at things in the stars and he's got these cufflinks and they're prime numbers. They're like these little dice and they're prime numbers on them. So he's got three and five and he's got five and seven and he's explaining to her about twin primes. Okay. The twin prime theorem, and it's a really cool theorem. And what it says is that there are these things called twin primes, and they are two primes that are separated only by an even number. Okay, well, we know if it's not two, it's not prime, right? So the only thing separating these two primes is the fact that you have to put, these are odd numbers, and you have to put an even between them when you count. Okay, so these are twin primes because there's just a six between them. And 11 and 13 are, are twin primes because there's just a 12. But then we start kind of skipping because we don't have a prime number in here anymore. 17 and 19 are twins but then we skip all the way to 23, so there's no twin in there. And then we skip all the way, we go from 19 up to 29, and actually the next prime is 31. So 29 and 31 are twin primes, but we skipped like nine numbers before we got to 29, right? So what we see is there are these twin primes and they're coming close together. Okay, we have several pairs here together in the lower numbers but eventually they start spreading out more and more and we don't see them as often. So the twin prime theorem says that actually they think, so let me give you another set. I don't know what all ones are in there. I'd have to in between, but I know 101 and 103 are a set of twin primes. 
So up here, above 100, I have a set of twin primes. So the theorem says that there will be twin primes forever. So infinite, infinitely. So sooner or later, I might find something like, I don't know, 305 and 307. Well, those maybe, maybe they're twin primes. So we might have a set that's way up there. There might be one that's a million and something, something, something. So that's the theorem. And he is trying to use this theorem to woo a woman. And apparently it worked. So there you go. That's the lesson for today is apparently math can 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 be nerdy and romantic at the same time. So <laughs> there you go. Lesson for the day. Now, really, um, the idea is that these things go on forever. And there's actually a theorem that has been proven. I'm not sure if this one's been proven or not. You can look it up and see. Um, but there is a theorem that says there are in, an infinite number of primes, and that has been proven. Um, some stuff called Marcian primes and different things like that. So there are tons of primes out there, and why do we care? Why is she going off on this prime um, sidetrack whenever this guy is named after Eratosthenes, but we don't even know if he did anything with it. It just has his name. Um, he gets the credit. And the reason why is because I think primes are a really good example for us to use you know, with, with non-mathematicians, if you're going to be a teacher with your students, things like that to discuss how math is everywhere around them. And if you don't believe me, look at your cell phone, everybody probably has one, and think to yourself, there are prime numbers in my cell phone, okay? <laughs> um, the next time you go online to wherever you shop online, Amazon or JCPenney's or whatever, and you go to enter your credit card number, <laughs> into their little thing, think to yourself, thank goodness for prime numbers, because it is prime numbers that allow us to encrypt and decrypt data, okay? So uh, there's classes out there called cryptography classes, um, you crypto, crypto classes, encoding and decoding information, and the really, really strong encryptions deal with really, really large prime numbers. And basically what they do is um, on your side of things, whenever you go to enter stuff, maybe you're sending a text message to a friend or something like that, um, and you don't want anybody to hack into your account and see what your text message is, they'll take really large prime numbers, a prime number times a prime number times a prime number and they multiply them together, that's what scrambles the code, okay? And they have something called an encryption key. And I'm gonna make this, just, it, it's more complicated than this, but this is the idea. I have an encryption key, and basically I send my data through the internet, send my, my credit card number out there for all the world to see, but I, hopefully before you you sent it, you saw this little lock thing at the bottom of your screen that said this is a locked, secure, um, I know I'm a terrible artist, this is a secure <laughs> form for me to put it in, and what happens is as it sends your credit card information, it, it encrypts it and it sends the key. And somebody on the other end of things at Amazon or wherever has this key. And because they have that key, they use it and they take, there's this giant number, okay, that came and the encryption key. And what they do is they take this giant number <laughs> and they use the encryption key and they split it back out and they have prime number times prime number times prime number whenever they use that key and they split it back out. And whenever they do that, that's how Amazon ends up with your credit card number, okay? And so it's all a matter of there's other ways to encrypt data, but the really strong ones, the really valuable ones that we see out there are prime numbers because it's really hard to just come up with a really big prime number all on your own, okay? Like if you didn't know 103 was prime, you might not guess it. But these are really big. They're way bigger than 103, okay? So um, that's kind of the idea behind that. So that's why I think prime numbers are really valuable for us. 
and I'm about to run out of time on my recording. So for funsies, I want you to look at Pythagoras and that's where we'll pick up on next time. Um, and I'll load up your homework in the, in the, the site because I don't want to have to make a separate video. All right, so that's it, Greek mathematicians. Thanks.